Hey everybody. Uh, today we're going to do a before and after on my wife's tank. Uh, this is a 20 gallon standard and it's just time for a little bit of maintenance. It's getting a little overgrown. It takes a long time for the plants in here to finally overgrow but they do eventually and there's some algae growing on the glass and it's just time to do a filter change and some basic maintenance. So we're going to get in here today and do a pretty big uh, cleaning on it. Uh, I normally just do about a 20% water change on this tank about once every few weeks and kind of leave it at that. Uh, as I've mentioned before, the plants grow very slowly. I don't have a lot of issues with algae or anything else. And uh, when I'm done the water change here, we'll look at the tank a little more specifically and we'll go over the different inhabitants in it. Uh, it is a little dark right now, and that is because the pennywort that I have in floating in there uh, is getting a little bushy and it is tending to block the light. The way the light is on this hood, it is pretty much centered, um, and the money wart is blocking, or I'm sorry, the pennywort is uh, pretty much blocking the majority of the light that comes in. So when we do the after, uh, portion of this video uh, you will see a much brighter and more uh, visible tank and we'll go in there and we'll look at some of the inhabitants right now you can probably see that frog uh, is in there dead center I've got the red fire dwarf garami is off to the left um, I do have a couple of glowfish the um, genetically modified uh, skirt tetras and for the very astute viewer of mine you will see there off to the right the Pineapple Swordtail. Uh, I did take him out of my brackish tank uh, for various reasons and we can talk about that later uh, in the video. But right now I'm going to go ahead and get started. We're just going to do a, a full change. You know, We're going to do the water change. We're going to wipe down the glass. We're going to do a filter change. I'm going to get in there and do a little bit of vacuuming and we're going to pull some of those plants out of there and uh, any other maintenance that needs to be done while we're in there. So sit tight and we will see what the next section holds. All right, everybody, there you go. There's your after. So this, again, is just one of these tanks that I don't do a whole lot of maintenance to um, up here in the upstairs. I've got another one in my living room, and I've got another one in my office that are the same way. And, uh, and the main reason is I just don't do a lot to them as far as feeding them. I don't put a bunch of food in the way I do in the basement. Uh, they don't get a wide variety of food. Uh, they get a mix between the algae wafers and uh, flake food, and that's pretty much it and it's two pinches a day it's pretty much textbook so doing a fifty percent water change once a month on these tanks is not really that much of an issue uh... the the plants that i got in there and removed is this that's the first time i've had to do that in oh i don't know probably last autumn uh... six months ago maybe i had to do that so the pennywort is a fast growing plant as you can see it's right up top underneath the light and yet i still only have to get in there uh, every very so often and do a little bit of uh, plant removal like that. If you will notice, I've got some of this java moss growing attached to that wood. Uh, java moss grows like a fiend and it's just not in here. I'll have to get in there fairly soon. It's starting to wake, make its way up towards the filter intake there, so I want to do something about that. Um, I think I actually might take some of that java moss and move it into one of my tanks down the basement. Um, I have made a decision about what I'm going to do with my empty 40, uh, so look forward to that. That's going to be a big surprise coming up here real soon. Uh, not going to give away any secrets yet. Um, but some of that java moss may end up in there as part of the plantscape, so that will be the one little teaser I'll give about that 40 breeder. Um, other than that, there's not a lot to talk about in this tank. The reason I don't get a lot of plant growth, I've discussed this before in other videos, is I simply don't have a whole lot of CO2 in the atmosphere up here in the upstairs versus what I do in my basement. And if you don't have a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, you don't have a lot of CO2 in your fish tank. And without a lot of CO2 and without very heavy lighting, you just don't get a lot of plant growth. I also don't do a lot in the way of feeding, as I was saying, and therefore I don't have real high nutrient loads in these tanks either. They're just I didn't even bother to check the nitrates, uh, honestly, when I did a water change on this tank. And I often don't. I just, you know, I don't really need to. There's nothing going on in this tank. I check it from time to time. Uh, today I didn't bother. I do have some more work to do up here in some other tanks, so as I do them, uh, they will they'll come and I'll just walk around and I'll test all these tanks at the same time. Uh, I do keep my eye on them, but it's just not anything I worry about on a regular basis. 
So who do I have in this tank? I've got the Red Fire Dwarf Garami that you can see right there front and center. That is red. I know it's a very creative name. This is about our third red we've had over the years. Uh, my Powder Blue Dwarf Garami is named Blue and he is in my living room tank. Uh, I also have the Pineapple Swordtail there uh, that was in my Brackish tank downstairs, but uh, the sexual aggression between the Molly and this Swordtail, and I have a Madagascan rainbow fish in that tank that is also male, all three males, uh, and without any females, they've been just chasing each other around to the point where I had to get that Swordtail out, and this is where it ended up. And then this morning, I actually took the Silver Molly out of there and put that in my office tank. So the office tank is actually empty with the exception of that one Molly. And uh, we're going to have to see how I uh, work that tank out now that I have a fish in it. Uh, so that would be something else to look forward to. So I also have some guppies in here. I honestly do not remember what kind they are. It's been so long since I put them in here. They're just some sort of fancy guppy. Uh, you can see the really long forked tail uh, on that one right there. I've also got a single threadfin rainbow fish right there. Uh, I had four of them at one point, but over the last couple years they've all died off. Uh, I had three males and two females, uh, and unfortunately that female is the only one I have left. And of course you can probably notice I have quite a few neons in there. I think there's about 14 or 15 neons in this tank. Uh, I've got four Corydoras on the bottom, uh, green cory and emerald cory, and I believe I have two... Um, pepper quarries in this tank as well. Uh, there is an Otocinclus. Uh, that is a skirt tetra. That is the very first skirt tetra I ever bought years ago. That is the very first. I never even knew what a skirt tetra was when I bought that, but I got a thing for purple, uh, and that fish is purple. I know it doesn't quite look that way, but it is, and it is actually called uh, galactic purple. Well, we just got to look at one of those quarries, so I obviously have a panda quarry and not pepper quarries. Um, so I just couldn't resist buying a fish that was called Galactic Purple. Uh, and then when I got it home, I actually looked it up to see what it was, and I learned that it was a skirt tetra, and then I found out that skirt tetras were supposed to be kept in schools. Um, so that gives you an idea of how long I've had that fish. I actually, when I got this fish, I had not yet heard the term nitrogen cycle. So skirt tetras can live for a little while, even these genetically modified ones like the glowfish. Uh, and then that blue glow fish is another one. I do have some more blue glow fish in my tank downstairs in my 29 miscellaneous. Um, and in my experience, I'll just go off on a little tangent side note about the glow fish. In my experience, the only ones that have ever survived are the blue ones. I have quite a few of the blue ones and they've lived for, uh, this one here I think has lived for two years now, pretty much since whenever they came out. So if you look and find out when the blue glow fish were released, uh, about a week from then is when I got this one. And then the ones I got downstairs were shortly after that, and they're all still alive. So all of the other ones, the orange ones, the yellow ones died very quickly. I went through several of them before I just gave up because they didn't seem to last more than a month. Uh, the orange ones didn't last very long. There's a pink one, I believe, that did not last very long. Um, and these are not dyed fish. Don't mistake them for the dyed fish, the, the dyed or the tattooed fish. That is completely different. It's a very cruel uh, practice they're actually dyeing the fish they're either stripping their slime coat off and soaking them in dye uh, or they are physically injecting dye into their bodies with needles like a tattoo um, it's like a 50 percent survival rate of the process and out of the ones that do survive uh, they've had very very shortened lives so do not ever buy dyed or tattooed fish i know they're neat looking but it is a very very cruel practice uh, and, it, and it kills the fish. These are actually genetically modified organisms, GMOs. Um, I'm not sure where they got the gene from that fluoresces. I believe it's like a jellyfish gene or something like that. And they've actually sequenced it into the genome of the fish and it is now that color. If those fish breed, their offspring will be blue like that. So they are a different fish now. They just have a blue a gene sequence in them or a purple gene sequence in them or whatever um, so there's no cruelty involved in that regard they're not you know suffering they've not been dyed they've not been stained uh, they are genetically modified so in a lot of countries they're not even legal uh, here in America they are one of the few uh, genetically modified animals that is available for uh, public consumption and they were the very first animals ever in the world actually to be uh, released for public 
uh, use rather than sort of some sort of scientific or governmental use. So there's still a little bit of controversy over them of whether or not, you know, genetically modified organisms should be allowed out into the public. If they get released into the wild, uh, especially in, a, in an area of the world where they could survive, you know, you're, you're definitely introducing genetically modified animals into a wild population. That's just never good. So you never, ever want to release any kind of aquarium fish back into the wild, even if it is a fish that lives in that uh, area. If it's been raised for the aquarium hobby, it does not have the same genetics as its wild counterparts, and you never want to mix those genetics. So just never release uh, aquarium fish back into the wild. It's never a good idea. And, of course, when you're talking about genetically modified organisms like this, it's never a good idea. You really don't want to do that. And, again, in most countries you can't do it because it's not even legal. So enough about those. We can look at this frog that we've been staring at dead center. At least I've been staring at dead center the whole time I was talking about the... Uh, other fish. I have two of them in this tank. One has no front legs, not really sure what happened to him, uh, but they just seem to sort of wither away months and months ago, and he's now a legless frog. He just has his back legs, and that's it. He gets around fine. He does all right. Uh, in fact, when I did the water change, he was up inside the... Um, uh, gravel vac and I did not realize it so when I went into the bathroom and put everything into the bathtub just you know to come back in and start filling the tank up uh, I actually saw the frog was in the tub and I had to collect him up and bring him back here um, and put him in the tank and he did I felt kind of bad he was a pretty pathetic sight a little frog with no front legs trying to crawl around in a bathtub uh, so he is back in the water safely where he can get around just fine uh, without his front legs um, and that's about it. I can't think of anybody else that would be in the tank that you have not seen yet or it is worth mentioning other than the Corys on the bottom. And, of course, I have uh, Otocinclus. I have Otocinclus everywhere. I love Otocinclus. They're fantastic fish. Um, there's a little bit of a look at the Corys as they group together. This is my one tank where the Corys seem to do very well, and the Corys actually do show that grouping behavior. Uh, I have other tanks that have multiple quarries in them, and they never really pile on top of each other the way these do in this tank. So I always like that. I always enjoy this. So there you go. That is a nice long look at a tank that we seldom see. This is, again, my wife's tank. Uh, when I say it's my wife's tank, it's a tank I put together for her and I maintain for her. Uh, all she has to do is sit in here and enjoy this before she goes to work or when she comes home in the evening, and it's just there for her. So thanks for watching this one. Hope you enjoyed it. If you're not subscribed already, please do so. That way you don't miss any updates. This was a spur of the moment sort of video. I just kind of threw this together today, and I do that quite often, so you don't want to miss any of them. So thanks for watching again, and I will see you real soon on the next one.